Hello everyone, my name is Rampal Gill. I'm delighted to welcome so many of you to our 10th project and community workshop. And this week we have many hours of interaction and discussion planned. I'll just remind all attendees that the session is being recorded and we'll post the recording to the website. Also, as attendees, you'll be muted throughout the duration of this plenary session. If you would like to submit a question, you can do so either by clicking Q&A button, which is at the bottom of your screen, or you can go to the Slack channel, the dedicated channel for this session, where you can also type your question. There's a number of team members that are online to answer your questions, and we're gonna to try to get through as many of your questions as we can today. But if we don't get through all of them, then you can look on that dedicated Slack channel for your answers later on today. If you need any help at any time at all, you can reach out to me by email or you can go over to the Slack help channel. So let's get this meeting kicked off and for that I'll hand you over to our director Steve Khan. Thanks very much Rampal and uh, let me also take this opportunity <coughs> to welcome all of you. By far the largest number of attendees we've ever had at a, at a project community workshop. So this is an exciting moment for us. Uh, our project manager, Victor Krabendam, will be driving the slides and he will speak shortly after I do. So Victor, can you go to the next slide? Uh, so this is our 10th project in community workshop and it's a significant event um, in a number of respects. Um, first off, uh, as I think most of you are aware, we've changed the name of the observatory. I'll say a little bit more about that in a, in a minute or so. Uh, but this is actually the first project and community workshop uh, we have held under the official name of the Vera C. Rubin Observatory, um, honoring Vera Rubin, who of course was uh, one of the pioneers in modern astronomy, having played such a significant role um, in uh, developing our modern concept of dark matter, providing evidence for it. It's also, um, interestingly, the 10th year anniversary of uh, a project and community workshop we held uh, when we received the number one ranking in the last uh, decadal survey. So uh, almost by coincidence, the press conference announcing the results of the decadal survey happened to occur during the week when we were holding our in-person project and community workshop in Tucson. Uh, and so we were able to have a champagne celebration of that event. So it's quite a memorable event for those of us who've been working on the project for many years. And of course that number one ranking was instrumental in allowing us to move forward into construction. And then this is, um, a bit of a mixed thing, but um, obviously because of the COVID pandemic, we're holding this workshop um, in a remote format as opposed to uh, the live um, versions that we've held each of the previous uh, years. And um, uh, that, that of course has its drawbacks. Hopefully we'll try to keep those to be as few as possible. But the plus side is that it's enabled a much larger uh, number of, of you to participate and we're, we're very happy about that. Um, the slide says of order 500 registered participants, but I learned this morning that the current number is now 611. Uh, so that's uh, an enormous show of the enthusiasm and interest uh, in the Rubin Observatory as we near the final stages of construction. And um, uh, also quite um, um, uh, uh, quite pleasantly for us, uh, the participants are distributed all over the world, showing the, the very wide impact that uh, the astro astronomical community and the lay community at large uh, has in this project. Um, in fact, we have attendees um, participating from nearly all the time zones in the world. Uh, this map at the bottom shows those breakouts. So that's really amazing. And we especially applaud those of you uh, living in time zones which are less hospitable to our operating hours. Uh, we apologize for that, um, particularly in, in Asia uh, and the Pacific. Um, this is not the, the, the best time for you to be up and participating in a video meeting, but we, 
we uh, are very happy that you've, you've chosen to undertake that opportunity uh, in any case. Okay, Victor, could you go to the next slide? Uh, I just want to uh, call your attention to the fact that um, as of a few years ago, we, we started adopting a code of conduct for all meetings associated with the Rubin Observatory. And uh, when you registered uh, for participation, you were asked to agree that you uh, choose to abide by this code of conduct. And this is very important to us because uh, we want to ensure that our meetings in general are as respectful as possible of the uh, great degree of diversity that exists in our community, uh, diversity in all respects, uh, and that participants in our meetings adhere to the principles of kindness, trust, respect, and inclusion um, to make a learning and interaction environment that is comfortable for everybody. Um, if you're aware of any discriminatory behavior, whether it's obviously intentional or even inadvertent, um, against colleagues on the basis of, you know, any characteristics, gender, gender identity, race, ethnic background, national origin, religion, political affiliation, age, marital status, etc. cetera. Um, please understand that we do not tolerate that. And if you, if you witness it, um, call attention to it uh, using the reporting information or the reporting instructions, which are in the code of conduct. So I think we can all play a part in, in ensuring that this is a, a pleasant and enjoyable meeting for everyone who, who is choosing to attend. Next slide. Um, this is a new uh, way of doing business for most of us um, since the COVID-19 situation um, presented itself. Uh, we're all getting used to and getting more adept at virtual interactions. Um, just a couple of comments about this particular meeting. So as Rampal mentioned, uh, all sessions of this workshop will be recorded and, um, and will eventually be posted or posted the next working day as indicated uh, via YouTube uh, on the session page. We recognize that some of you may be uncomfortable having your image or even your voice recorded and um, we understand that. Um, but if you, if you really would not prefer not to have your presence uh, recorded in any sense, then uh, of course you're free to use your video mute button and your audio mute button. Uh, so if you, if you really don't want to be recorded, then that is your easiest way to participate in the session, at least by hearing uh, and seeing what everybody else is saying, but, but without recording your presence directly. Um, you know, part of the code of conduct is, is showing appreciation, not only not showing negative elements. And um, please um, use the various tools available through both Slack and through Zoom to show your appreciation of various things, the applause icon or the thumbs up icon. Um, that's particularly helpful with the questions because if the participants uh, indicate agreement or interest in a number of the questions which are submitted online, then that will help us to prioritize them in terms of which questions to, to answer if we have limited time available. Next slide. Um, well, all of you almost by definition have, have found a way to connect to at least this session. Uh, so you've, you've managed to navigate that far. Uh, in the agenda, which you have online, um, the, both the Slack channel and the Zoom join information are present as buttons. So um, that is um, uh, how you can uh, connect with us. And then uh, even for this first session, there are some preview materials available. In this case, uh, talks that were given by myself and by Victor at our recent joint directors review, which provides some background information. So those are there for your viewing, either before the session itself or, or when you have time later. Next slide. Uh, and uh, so there are various ways to interact with us. Um, Slack uh, is uh, the primary 
uh, way to uh, to indicate things. And as Rampal suggested at the beginning, if, if you're having problems using Slack or with Zoom or with anything, you can use the hash help uh, tag there to get a hold of us. The Twitter hashtag for this workshop is hash Ruben 2020. Um, as we mentioned earlier, the video recordings will be posted by the next day and the presentations will be downloaded uh, from the agenda page. So you should be able to get most of the information that you would like. Um, and then on Friday, we'll have a closeout session where each of the session shares will be asked to present one slide uh, summarizing, their, summarizing their session and with some indication of the discussion and the interaction that occurred. So I look forward to attending that on Friday. And for those of you who are chairing sessions, make sure you have that one slide summary available. Next slide. Uh, just so some, some updates on uh, Ruben Observatory. Um, I think, as I mentioned earlier, all of you are aware that we renamed the observatory. The renaming occurred officially uh, in January of this year, and it was actually an act of Congress, uh, although the discussion of uh, honoring Vera um, possibly through, through the renaming of LSST actually goes back quite a long ways. Um, so th this slide indicates what our naming conventions are. Actually, in January, we adopted three new names. Uh, so first off, the project itself, our facilities in Chile and Tucson, will here to four um, be collectively named the Vera C. Rubin Observatory, honoring Vera. Um, at the same time, we renamed the actual telescope, um, the astronomical telescope itself, after Charles Simoni and his family. And so uh, at, as of January, the official name of the telescope is the Simoni Survey Telescope. Not the Charles Simoni Survey Telescope, but the Simoni Survey Telescope. And that recognizes Charles' desire uh, that it honor both his father, who, um, who he was devoted to, uh, and his, his daughters that are, that, you know, have shown an interest in astronomy, as well as himself, of course. Um, and um, for those of you who don't know, Charles um, was responsible for um, a very important uh, philanthropical gift early on in the history of the project. Uh, both from him personally and from Bill Gates, who's a close friend of Charles, uh, that enabled us to get started early with the fabrication of the primary tertiary mirror, which of course is a key long lead time element of uh, the Rubin Observatory. And it was essential that we get this started um, while we were waiting to get federal approval for the project. And then finally, there's um, you know, some fondness that most of us have for the LSST acronym. And, um, and we've managed to preserve that. Uh, that will be applied to the 10-year survey uh, that the Rubin Observatory will perform during the first 10 years of its lifetime. Um, and we renamed that the Legacy Survey of Space and Time, which preserves the LSST acronym. Uh, and in fact, even the logo, as you see. So just to be clear on this, the, the observatory itself is the Rubin Observatory. The physical telescope is the Simone Survey Telescope. And the actual 10-year survey is the LSST, the Legacy Survey of Space and Time. And one key element of this, uh, and this is at the request of the National Science Foundation, is that we do not shorten it to the Vera Rubin Observatory. VRO. Um, many, of, many of you or some people in the community have already started using that acronym and um, that is uh, verboten. Okay, please do not use that shortening. Uh, if you want to say something shorter than Vera C. Rubin Observatory, you can say Rubin or you can say Rubin Observatory or Rubin OBS or something on slide presentations, but please do not resort to VRO because that is a discouraged acronym. Next slide. Um, many of you uh, participated in the uh, shutdown STEM 
uh, activities that occurred on June 10th following the, um, the killing of, of uh, George Floyd and others. Um, the, um, this had a profound effect on our, our community itself. Many uh, Rubin Project members chose to observe that, that strike day. And they used the opportunity to conduct Zoom meetings uh, with discussion points, um, which um, uh, were, you know, raised a lot of interesting discussion about the way we run our project and about uh, the way our community interacts. And so those are now um, being, being captured and converted into an action plan uh, that you know we can all learn from and move forward with. Um, next slide. Uh, even prior to uh, the shutdown STEM event, of course, we had uh, significant activity within uh, within the Rubin Observatory and LSST to our workplace culture. Uh, we had appointed a set of six workplace culture advocates. Uh, they represent the uh, broad set of institutions and locations that are participating on this project. Uh, so Sandrine Thomas, who's our telescope and site project scientist based primarily in Tucson. Uh, Richard Dubois, who's a, a staff scientist at SLAC uh, in Menlo Park, California. Chuck Gessner, our uh, chief safety officer, uh, so again, primarily based in, in Tucson, but frequently in Chile. Um, Andy Connolly, who's our uh, simulation scientist uh, and uh, is a professor at the University of Washington in Seattle. Uh, Carol Chirino uh, is our administrative manager at the La Serena office in Chile. And Felipe, Felipe Dariuch is uh, a senior electronics engineer also based in La Serena. Uh, so these are our, our set of workplace culture advocates. They've been meeting um, regularly to discuss ways in which we can uh, improve um, our sense of inclusion um, and looking at ways to improve diversity on the project. Plus, they've been um, contact points uh, for those members of our community and our project uh, who have concerns about the culture. So they, they are friendly advocates to discuss uh, issues with. Uh, and bring them to the attention of management. Uh, so this program has been in existence for a while. We've expanded it and evolved it uh, accordingly, but I just wanna make you aware of that if you haven't already made contact with one of our advocates. Next slide. Um, okay, so I, at this stage, I'll turn it over to Victor who will um, uh, provide some more information on the workshop itself and also give you um, a brief tour of recent progress on the project. Victor? Great. Thanks, Steve. Can you hear, hear me okay? I will yeah, this is assume good. that's yes. yes. Okay. Um, again, uh, my name is Victor Krabendam. I'm the project manager for all of Rubin Observatory Construction. And I also want to welcome everybody, all 611 of you, um, and really extend my thanks for participating. Uh, it was not clear how well um, this year's PCW was going to go, but clearly uh, this is uh, showing to be a, a success uh, already with the, with the numbers that have registered. So uh, let me just uh, point again to the overview of the agenda. You all have access to this online. And let me just point out a couple of items that will be happening. You'll, you'll have already noticed that we've, we've dedicated the uh, sort of a four hour core group four time period each day uh, to the uh, PCW. And if we just focus in on a couple of points on Thursday, I really want to uh, highlight that uh, Dr. Brian Nord uh, has agreed to give us a nice uh, talk uh, for a keynote address. And I uh, really want to point that out to you, invite you to participate on Thursday morning uh, and join us for that exciting talk. Also on Friday, want to point out that uh, along the lines of what Steve was saying uh, about our, our interest in diversity, equity, and inclusion, we do have a, a couple of slots uh, identified for some good discussions. And here is a, a slight intro or a short intro um, from Keith Bechtel.
Welcome to the Rubin Observatory Project and Community Workshop 2020. This short talk provides an introduction to the justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion sessions scheduled for Friday this week at 9 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time. Federica Bianco, Keith Bechtel, and Andres Plazas have organized this session. This is Keith speaking. This year, we would like to focus on the persistent problem of anti-Black racism in physics and astronomy and the steps that the broad Rubin Observatory community can take to increase the participation of Black scientists in research activities based on Rubin Observatory data. We begin with a quote from the Team Up report published this year. Why is systemic change difficult? First order institutional changes are those that modify processes to better achieve an established goal. Second order changes are those requiring that underlying norms, values, and culture be addressed before changes can occur. This is the kind of change we aspire to. Second order changes are distinguished by qualitative jumps, new directions in thinking, and shifts in priorities. Second order changes are not business as usual, but rather require changes as individuals, groups, and the entire organization. Without these deeper changes occurring at all levels of the Rubin community, isolated initiatives will be less effective. We have two goals for Friday's session. First, effective institutional change begins with a shared long-term goal. We propose that the Rubin Observatory community adopt a shared goal to maximize the number of students who self-identify as Black that pursue research involving Rubin Observatory data during the 10 years of LSST operations. We believe that the Rubin Observatory community is both a unique in a unique position to affect change and has an imperative to do so from a social justice perspective. The second goal is to recognize the importance of changing our underlying norms, values, and culture in order to realize the objective above. Friday's session includes time for individual reflection, breakout discussion, and a large group discussion. On this slide, we also provide examples of prompts that you may see on Friday. Here is how to prepare for Friday's session. First, we ask that as you go through the PCW week, you pay attention to the interactions within your Rubin community. Try to identify obstacles to inclusion and equity and reflect on the ways in which our current culture is exclusionary. Tomorrow, we will send you an email asking you to read the chapter titled, A Call to Action from the Team Up Report, which motivates the need for deeper cultural change in our institutions and discusses concepts of sense-making and shared leadership. On Wednesday, we will ask you to read a primer on the theory of change process. We aim to take the first steps in this process on Friday, namely to articulate the long-term goal and identify preconditions. The breakout discussions will be organized by self-selected spheres of influence. That is your ability to affect change in your immediate surroundings. We ask that you take a minute to select a sphere of influence in the Google form linked on this slide to help us prepare the logistics for Friday session. We also provide links on the next slide to several other collections of resources, many of which have been compiled and or created by our Rubin Observatory colleagues, for which we are deeply thankful. See you on Great, thanks, Keith, for that uh, introduction. And with uh, 600 of you, uh, participating from across the globe. I really hope that uh, many of you will participate on Friday and bring uh, some different voices and some different ideas to the table. Uh, also, I wanted to point out in the, in the agenda is uh, one of the PCW favorites is the lightning stories. And so we will have those running on a reel um, for those of you joining a little bit earlier than nine o'clock on Tuesday and Wednesday. Uh, so please do join and, and watch those uh, as you prepare for the plenary uh, for, on those two days. And finally, um, the, when, we, when we delayed, or not, we didn't delay, when we canceled the in-person version of the PCW in March, we really um, had no idea exactly how the pandemic was going to unfold. Uh, we really also didn't have any idea of how well we could run a virtual meeting. And so we, we started off with simply canceling the in-person version and just saying we would try to do something. And it's, uh, it is the work of these people and the organizing committee uh, over the past four months that have really made um, the difference and made this week uh, possible. And so um, my thanks uh, specifically to this group. Um, and I hope you all join me in thanking them all for 
uh, putting a lot of time and effort into uh, putting together uh, this virtual uh, PCW for 2020. Also, if you have, if you're running one of the sessions uh, and want to do a little test of your own to make sure your uh, connections are working, uh, each day uh, at 1.30 uh, Pacific Daylight Time, there is an hour set aside for a prep room and there's uh, some volunteers that have, that have uh, um, agreed to be online at that point so that you can test your equipment uh, to be ready for, uh, for, for running your session. So please do take advantage of that. And so I think um, at this point, I just wanted to touch on a couple of uh, construction updates. Steve had pointed out that we gave you access to uh, two presentations that we started off our director's review for uh, the status for this year. Uh, and in each of those, uh, you get a sense of uh, Steve's overarching um, uh, introduction to the status of, of the overall project for this year. And I also went into some details uh, but pretty much at a, at a programmatic sense. So I still encourage you to go watch those videos if you're interested, and then um, add to that just a, a really quick blitz walkthrough of, of where we stand as a project um, to give you a sense of where we are uh, at this stage. So as with everybody else, uh, as a response to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, every office, every lab, uh, and the summit closed up um, for a, a work from home um, endeavor that started in March. Uh, and up until that point, it's really unfortunate because we were making extremely good progress uh, on the site and across the globe. Uh, progress was really going well. And um, thankfully, uh, even after we started working from home, uh, it's, it's really uh, heartening to see just how much work uh, was still able to be accomplished. Everybody's got different situations at home and, and different challenges but uh, the progress continued. And um, also like to report that even though um, in many places we're still closed, that in some, in, in some locations like at SLAC um, and in some uh, small cases in Tucson, we are starting to slowly get back to work. Uh, and that's um, really uh, pleasant to see, but it's really slow at this point. One of the things that was able to continue um, over the last six months in particular, after the renaming of the observatory, uh, the telescope and the, the, um, the LSST now, the survey, was the branding. And so we've got a new name and Rampal and her team are, are, are deeply engaged in trying to rebrand as well. And so we've got logo development going on. And while our original hope was that we could present a new brand at this PCW, it's going to be another month or so before we're able to uh, bring that process to a conclusion. So I invite you to stay tuned and watch our social media uh, when we get to that point. Also uh, across the board, uh, one of the things that uh, you'll see, uh, hopefully you'll see that's predominant in what we do is to keep safety as a value and a significant part of, of, of what we plan and how we strategize. And over the last six months, um, or actually the last year since we last uh, engaged with the, with the community at the PCW 2019, we've had thousand, over a thousand tons of material has now been brought to the summit. Um, all of that has been done safely. Uh, and in one of the key points for the early part of this last year was to bring the dome and the telescope mount integration activities together. And so that was a, that was a, uh, a big effort uh, in the September to January timeframe, and I'm happy to report that that was uh, very successful uh, due to a lot of planning from the safety team, the management team, the technical team, and so forth. Uh, after COVID-19 hit, our safety team has been deeply engaged in making sure that the site inspections that are going on and that any of the activities that we can put uh, in place are all done very safely, not just for industrial safety, but now also with, uh, with, with COVID-19 in mind. And, and that team has also been extremely involved in setting up our exposure prevention plan and procedures uh, to make sure that this uh, uh, virus does not infect any of our team um, and their families. So if we just do a quick around the, uh, around the work breakdown structure and start with the telescope in sight. These are just some images that give you a sense of where we stand. Uh, this past year, as I mentioned, has been uh, we've seen some significant advancements 
uh, starting in the top left with the dome cladding work. Um, and that's, uh, that was nice to see. Unfortunately, uh, you'll also see in some pictures that during the COVID, uh, because of the COVID-19 shutdown, we didn't quite finish that. Uh, and so that's, a, that's an issue for us at this point. The image that's uh, top, top of your screen is uh, an, a, an oxtail image that's hidden by, um, uh, th those that came from oxtail uh, early use. Um, and then if we can to the right, uh, you'll see the beginnings of the telescope mount that is the telescope mount on the summit being constructed uh, that was making excellent progress, was in fact ahead of schedule before we had to shut down. Uh, but we're really happy with the way that's progressing. Uh, bottom right is uh, Tomi doing some work getting prepared, getting the coating chamber prepared for M1, M3 coating uh, later next year. Um, as you know, uh, we reported on last year, that same coating chamber uh, successfully put down the M2 coating, uh, reflective coating, uh, that is now uh, sitting in a box uh, waiting for us to be able to integrate it onto the telescope. Uh, M2 itself as a system is shown in the bottom middle. Uh, that system with its surrogate, that's the aluminum with the, with the, uh, the, the recesses in it, in the image, has also been, uh, is fully assembled in the, in the summit facility and the teams have been working through debugging and testing and integrating it with our systems uh, and working through that. And then on the, the, the bottom left is just a collage of pictures showing the teams of people that are both the, the, um, the, the engineers uh, for the hardware, but also engineers for the software, all getting together uh, with the hardware coming together uh, and, and, and seeing that integration activity happening, which is something that's really been a focus in this last year. Uh, at Slack, I think at this point last year, uh, we would have reported that all of the science rafts, I think were either all done or nearly done. And so they are all sitting in, uh, in California at Slack. Um, and in fact, uh, in a moment, we'll get to the, 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 the final image on the far right, which shows all of them installed. But all of the hardware is also in, at Slack at this point. Uh, you see lots of images uh, of the camera body coming together. The lenses have all been delivered and, and integrated into their cells. Um, and the hardware that came from France uh, is also now at Slack. Um, and you see the, all of these images uh, showing a, a robust amount of uh, integration happening uh, happening there. And then, as I mentioned, the, the far right is just a beautiful, uh, fantastic image of the, of the focal plane, fully populated uh, with all of the science sensors and the, the, the corner rafts. Uh, the DM system continues uh, to, to develop as well with excellent progress even through the, the, the shutdown and the work from home. Uh, and and the, with the starting with the top left, the, um, the Rubin uh, science platform still continues to be the, the mainstay for how we plan on interacting with the public, uh, with the science community on data. Uh, and while the, the portal uh, it has, is still on hold for development and won't be started up again until later next year, the middleware and architecture group has already has started to port Gen 3 into the framework. Uh, we're also working uh, with the team to continue to find better ways and more efficient ways uh, to process uh, the data. And in this case, I wanted to point out that the image capture and transfer which is something that we have to do for calibration, we have to do for the actual science data as well, is something that we're looking into uh, deeply at this point in time. Uh, the release 20 of the science pipeline is out. Uh, there's an image on the top right that's just a demonstration of uh, sort of a complex field uh, that had to be deblended using Scarlet that's now built into, into uh, version 20. And there's lots of other new features uh, that, that have come out and invite you to, co to, to engage in that. Uh, and see how that's developing. QServe is now um, uh, available and stood up at NCSA and CCI and 2P3 uh, so that the developers can really start to engage in that uh, in a bigger way. Uh, there's also uh, several more data sets that have been made available uh, for use uh, in testing uh, that are, that are uh, listed there as well. So long haul networks, I think last year we reported that the, that the network was essentially complete and um, as per the plan, it has continued to expand and, and become, uh, and the capacity has continued to grow uh, as, uh, as scheduled. And so that's going well. And uh, as we move to the bottom left, I just wanted to point out that the DM team is deeply involved with 
the, uh, the early work that's going on that's right now is focused on Oxtel, um, but it has included the telescope and sight team, the DM team, um, and the sitcom, the commissioning team, in coming together to really use that opportunity with the system on sky uh, to be testing out the system uh, across the board. And finally, uh, we'll hear a little bit more about it uh, from uh, Bob tomorrow for operations. Uh, but as many of you have heard that the data facility um, has been, uh, is now in a little bit of a state of flux and where we're gonna put that. Uh, but we'll, as I said, Bob will discuss that a little bit more tomorrow. Uh, and while that does put some uncertainty into the construction team, uh, construction plan, I think we have good um, measures in place to make sure that that doesn't disrupt uh, any more than, uh, than necessary. And then uh, finally, or not finally, but also if we bring those three systems in particular together, uh, we have this, the systems engineering and commissioning group that's really engaging uh, deeply right now. And we, it was sort of uh, early on described as sort of pre-commissioning and pre-integration activities. Uh, and here you can see um, also uh, the image again of the, the control room while we were doing Oxtel observations um, and, and SITCOM was there uh, during that as a, as a really good opportunity to start doing some testing and integration. Uh, the test planning as we move to the right is uh, there's a screenshot, just an image to, to demonstrate that how we test, how we plan on testing, how we plan on finishing up the project is a, is a significant element um, and a significant thrust for, for the project at this point. And then you start to see some of these images of a lot of the individual work that's going on. And I want to point out the middle uh, the center middle picture, which is ComCam at that point was in the in state of, of, of shipping. I'm happy to report that ComCam is now in Chile and has been uh, reassembled um, and is uh, sort of in a preliminary state of functional to support uh, additional testing um, as we even know we're in this uh, state, uh, this work from home state. And then uh, the education and public outreach, uh, they continue to develop, even though we uh, lack the visual identity, they're working a lot on what can go on the web, um, what can be, uh, what kind of information can we present to the community in that fashion. Uh, there's also a lot of effort going into uh, engagement, uh, these sort of interactive engagement with some widgets that allow people to engage into the science a little bit more deeply, but still um, at a generic enough or at a broad enough level that we really hope to pull in um, the non-specialists uh, into the thrill of, of the science uh, that Ellis, that, that Rubin Observatory will bring. And then the education program has also been a focus this year uh, with a lot of the, the formal education, a lot of product being, uh, being completed and with the, a lot of effort also going into user testing and engaging with, um, with, with formal educators um, at a broad sense. Uh, and of course, the challenge this year was that uh, the, all of that testing had to be brought online as well uh, into virtual, but credit to the team for being able to make that happen and to, to continue with that, uh, that effort. So um, in the final couple of slides here, uh, people are the project. Uh, they remain our, our biggest asset. One of the be best things we can do for the team at this stage of the project as things are starting to wind down in some, in some areas uh, is to have a, a really good plan for how we transition, uh, how, we trans how we complete the project, but uh, most importantly, how we uh, interact with the operations team to make sure that there's a good transition from construction into ops. And so that's a, an effort that's been going on that, um, that both the construction leadership and the operations leadership has been deeply involved in. And then a couple of announcements, um, because we had just had this opportunity uh, to, to say thanks, essentially. Uh, there's a couple of, uh, of our leadership team that are st uh, starting to transition. John Swinbank, for example, uh, we're sad to see him leave later this year. I believe it's in October. Uh, he has a, an exciting new opportunity uh, that we're happy for uh, for him, but uh, sad to have him leave uh, leave the project. And then on, you know, many of you know Jeff Cantor is a longtime member of the team, uh, one of the originals dating back um, to the early 2000s. And um, Jeff is going to start dialing back uh, his hours and his efforts. So um, there's some some transition of scope going on there. Jeff will continue to be there, but I just wanted to take this opportunity to say thanks to Jeff for all of that. But even as we're starting to, de uh, to, to change uh, the staffing 
uh, for completion. We're also uh, continuing to, to refresh uh, and to expand in some other areas. For example, uh, we are starting to, we're, we're finishing up the activity of bringing on some observing specialists as we uh, plan to get more and more opportunities to be on sky. Uh, we'll start first starting with Oxtel and then eventually with the main telescope. And then, as I mentioned, that the, the verification activity is really a, a thrust at this point. So we're looking at some uh, at, at hiring a verification scientist. Uh, and then the EPO team, while working uh, really hard on the content, uh, is also looking to, uh, to develop the back end. And so there's an open position for a back end developer uh, as well. And then we're also um, continuing to refresh as some of our team members um, uh, have departed that we have an IT engineer position that's available uh, or coming soon in, 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 uh, to, be, to be based in Chile. So just, to, just to, to identify a couple of the items that are coming up um, on, the, on, the late, on the staffing front. And then to, to finish it all off, uh, this is something that you're all becoming painfully familiar with uh, and what, what it looks like to run a, run a meeting and at Rubin, we're, we're uh, getting very used to it. Um, and this is just one example. I believe this is during the uh, director's review uh, just recently. So uh, with that, I want to end and leave uh, 20 minutes or so for questions and answers. Um, but uh, it's, it's both nice to see uh, this picture of the summit facility. It's sad to see that there is no activity going on, um, but we're absolutely looking forward to starting to ramp up as we can get through the COVID-19 uh, issues at hand. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing screen. I think we have uh, given you several indications of ways to um, engage and to submit some questions. There's a QA and a um, opportunity right in uh, the Zoom platform. There's also the um, Slack channels that uh, Rand Powell had uh, mentioned early on. Thank you very much, Victor and Steve. Okay, there's a few questions that we can start off with and maybe these will inspire some other people to come up with some questions. Uh, let me just do a quick check with Melissa. Do you have some questions there in Slack? Um, yeah, there is one question that just came in and they ask, uh, this might be covered elsewhere, but what's the current survey start date? And what's the current assessment of COVID impact on that? Or is it too early to say? Uh, well, let me start with that and then Victor can chime in. Uh, thanks for that question, and uh, of course, this is um, something that everybody is worrying about. Um, I think, as you're all aware, you know the the situation with COVID is still very much uncertain, so it's hard to make firm predictions. As Victor mentioned, we have stopped our construction operations on the summit in Chile as of uh, March, early March, and uh, those are still on hold. And so until we can get back onto the mountain on a regular basis, in particular with the, the telescope mount assembly construction team uh, and the dome team, um, we can't confidently say what the delays will be. Um, but we, we are at this stage expecting uh, somewhere between six months and a year. Uh, this will affect us uh, just partly uh, to you know, decide uh, that we can resume uh, operations on a regular basis uh, and then assess the impacts of having effectively mothballed the system for an extended period of time. Uh, work on the camera has resumed at Slack, uh, although at a uh, somewhat less efficient basis. Um, and so it, it does look like the pacing item is going to be the telescope reassembly. <laughs> Victor, let me uh, see if you want to make additional comments about that. My dog had something to say. Um, yeah, I just want to just to emphasize that, as Steve said, we have uh, slowly started, but unfortunately, the critical path for the project to be done with construction goes through the telescope and 
yeah. Uh, goes through the telescope mount, and and that is one of that, that's a that's a vendor deliverable from, and the vendor is in Spain. So there's a lot of things that are just outside of our control at this point that actually dictate the whole schedule. And so while we're making excellent progress where we can, uh, that's what's going to drive the schedule. Rampal, you're muted. Yeah, I was just looking at a question that came in, but it looks like Bob answered it. It was just, um, how is the COVID situation specifically in Chile? Uh, well, Bob may have answered that on the chat, but for those of you just listening in, um, Chile was, was somewhat late, as was most of South America, in seeing significant rise in COVID uh, in the spring. Um, uh, and then for a while, it was it was quite an issue in Chile. Um, there is some sign of a downturn now, but the area where our office is and where the mountain is located in the Coquimbo La Serena area is currently under quarantine as of about a week or so ago. And uh, so there's still a, a somewhat alarming case right there. Uh, obviously, everybody is watching the situation closely. And Melissa, did you have, your, I think there was a follow-up question came in. Is. Yeah, there's a follow-up question to like on the same topic of COVID. Um, in addition to the start date for the survey, also whether there's any comments you want to make on the impact to commissioning, either in the start of commissioning or duration of commissioning. So at this point in time, um, we are um, clearly in discussion with both NSF and DOE about uh, how to replan the project um, given the COVID delays and the COVID impacts. Uh, those discussions are not yet complete. This is a, a new kind of occurrence for both agencies with a project of this magnitude. And so they're learning on the fly uh, along, with, along with us and the rest of the world. Um, the uh, issue of at, at, at this point, we are not planning any further reductions in scope or duration for the construction effort uh, once we get back uh, engaged. So our current plan for commissioning is the same as it was pre-COVID. Uh, there is an extended commissioning period in the plan, period in the plan uh, and that is unchanged. Um, but will be, along with the rest of the project, will clearly be delayed. Thank you for that. A question has come in from Federica. Uh, how is the observatory preparing for possibly recurrent quarantines? Are there discussions with the Chilean government to enable progress on construction even in these circumstances? Yeah, let me take the first one and then Victor, I'll, I'll let you discuss the impacts with um, the Chilean government or the discussions with the Chilean government. So, you know, the, uh, both, both DOE and NSF, as well as many other institutions that we're connected with, have all gone through various kinds of COVID, COVID planning efforts, COVID risk assessments, etc. And they range from you know, in general, from the mo more optimistic, uh, what are the effects to date and what would happen if you're delayed another month or two, to more hypothetical scenarios where there's a second wave, a second shutdown, et cetera. So we have, in some cases, uh, been required to plan out those uh, potentialities um, and in, in other cases, just done it on our own. Um, but there's a lot of uncertainty there, of course. Um, we have been looking very intensively at mitigation uh, actions we can take, um, you know, acknowledging the COVID risk. Uh, are there ways, for example, that we can quarantine on site on the mountain? Uh, and various other kinds of things that we can do, uh, reducing the density of staff working in any particular situation. Um, but I think uh, everybody would say at this point, the the questions um, uh, outnumber the answers, really, is since we're all a bit guessing as to how this disease will play out and, and what the impacts will be. 
Um, this meeting, of course, as Victor mentioned, we, we took a decision relatively early on that we couldn't hold a in-person meeting and we're not planning any in-person meetings for, uh, for at least the next few months, if not uh, for a longer time after that. Um, that's just the kind of thing that you do. And uh, fortunately, the, um, uh, we, we made a lot of use of virtual communications and that's allowed us um, to stay productive, even though the vast majority of our staff are working from home and we are not meeting in person together. Other than that, it's hard to offer a more concrete answer. Victor, why don't you discuss the discussions with the Chileans uh, through Aura, et cetera? Yeah, let me just say the, the our team and uh, our Aura team in Chile has uh, maintained a really good relationship with the local authorities and uh, to the extent that that provides us with information, uh, we continue to keep that uh, channel open uh, to learn as much as we can about plans and, and the way that uh, the, the local authorities plan to move forward with, with restrictions and so forth. Uh, to that extent, though, um, that is reacting to what's happening. Um, and we are well aware that things could recur. Uh, but in the meantime, the best we can do is to have good exposure prevention plans in place, good processes in place, because we do have a team of upwards of six to 10 people that are going to the summit um, basically once a week uh, to check on things, make sure that everything is still safe, uh, particularly since it's winter down there, uh, we do have to do some mitigations for, for weather. And so uh, that has been enabled by our ability to interact with the local authorities, get permissions to have our teams traverse between La Serena and the summit. Um, even uh, as the full quarantine was enacted uh, a week ago. And so again, not really definitive, uh, but it hopefully gives you a sense that we're aware um, and trying to communicate the, as best we can, uh, both to the authorities plus also to the teams. Okay, let's go over to Melissa to see if she has uh, any questions showing up on Slack. Yeah, there are some questions on Slack. Um, people are asking about M2. Since it's been coded already and it's now um, sitting in a box and waiting, um, is it possible that the coding might degrade and will it need to be redone before the, um, before the survey starts? So we have a... No, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was, I was gonna take that one, if you want. Go ahead, Chuck. Okay, so uh, the answer to that question is, um, we continue to monitor the performance of the coding even during the shutdown. Um, it's as part of our um, routine visits to the summit to check on maintenance, the evaluation of the coding is um, uh, on the list. Um, as we get closer to a replan of the project uh, post COVID, we'll evaluate the state of the coding I will tell you the group writ large that in my current thinking on, on in commissioning is that um, we will plan to uh, recoat M2 before the start of operations. We'll see if that fits into the schedule or not, but that's my current thinking because by the, by the time we get to operations, the M2 coding will be multiple years of age and um, you know, the, the overhead for recoding M2, once it's installed with the LSST camera on the, um, the telescope structure is fairly significant. And so um, even if it costs us a little bit extra time during commissioning, I think it will, um, having a fresh coating on M2 when we enter into operations is something that we should uh, strongly consider. Victor, you wanted to add anything else to that? Nope. I think that answers. Let, let me just point out for those of you who uh, don't know Chuck, Chuck is our uh, commissioning and uh, integration test scientist, lead scientist. Okay, I'll, uh, I have a question here. Uh, from the pre-recording, what kinds of DM-related hardware was descoped to save eight million dollars, and does this have any impact on data access or processing resources for science users? 
So let's give that one to Will O'Malley. Will, can you take that question? Sure. Um, so um, I better go over there. One second. Amazing how you were able to move windows just so easily across my screen. I was able to um, to move across yes to a different location. The um, the D scope or, re or right sizing was to remove from construction uh, the side the first year's hardware purchase for operations. Um, that obviously means there's an operations cost that comes up to buy that hardware in operations instead of in construction. So an answer to the sizing for data access etc. It should have no operational impact on that, um, as long as we've understood and we have understood with Bob that ops need to still furnish enough hardware to serve all the users in year one and do the data processing. So it should have no actual impact for end users. Great, thanks Will. And for those of you who don't know Will, Will is our, uh, the deputy project manager for software uh, and the uh, manager for the data management effort. Couple of minutes remaining. I'll check back in with Melissa to see if there's anything on Slack. Yes, there is another question on Slack that has a bunch of upvotes. And the question is, has there been any engagement with LEO satellite operators other than SpaceX uh, in the mitigation efforts, ultimately mitigating the impacts of Starlink satellites is great, but um, this would need to be extended to other fleets. So we'll have a talk on this by uh, Tony Tyson. Uh, later in the program. Um, but Tony, you want to take this particular question now? Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, yes, um, Amazon has been in contact with us and also OneWeb. Um, in its early days, as you know, uh, any mitigation on their part must be done during design of the uh, bus. So early days still. And just to clarify for everyone on the abstract for this session, there is a recording, a 15 minute recording from Tony uh, discussing the, these issues. I see that we are at the top of the hour. Uh, Melissa, I just wanna check if there's any pressing questions on your end. Um, reminder that we will continue to answer any uh, open questions on the Slack channel, and questions can be asked uh, for the duration of the week on that Slack channel. Melissa? Nothing pressing. Thanks, everyone. So let me take this opportunity to thank you once again for joining our workshop. Uh, it's been a delight, and I hope to interact with as many of you as possible as we go through the week. Thank you everyone. So the recording of this session will be posted on the workshop website within the next day or so. And it's time for a break now and we'll resume at 10.30 Pacific Daylight Time with breakout sessions. Please check the uh, website, the specific workshop website and page for the Zoom meeting that you need to uh, join because there are two sessions and they each have their own link. Reminder, if you need any help at all, please email me or Slack us on the hash Slack hash help slack channel and i uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your day thanks everyone <laughs>